something that a lot of people are doing with data science, commercial provider, and they just bought IT. Right, right, yeah. They've actually bought it. They didn't get it. Well, that's the thing. They bought it, but now it's like part of the, the product. It's been a part of the product for the last couple of versions, but they're showing it to
Hey guys, you don't have to get quiet right now. <laughs> I'm taking a picture of this because this is a great turnout and it's in a really cool space that we started using. So, you know, just, just show, us, show us your smile. You know? <laughs> so many of you guys. Um, yeah, I'm going to grab some water. Please continue. <laughs> Pennsylvania, and uh, Timothy, a local fellow, who's been here before. Um, so they'll, they'll talk about what they're going to talk about. I'm going to leave them to uh, introduce their talks. Um, just because we have two speakers, I want to hurry this up a little bit. Uh, thank you to uh, Eastern Foundry for giving us this spectacular space. Um, it, not an understatement, having a, a great location near the metro really impacts turnout. We've done the data behind it. And uh, it's, it's true. It really works. Metro does work. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, Eastern Foundry will come up and talk about themselves yeah. for a second. Sure. Yeah, come on. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, just to give you guys a little bit of background on Eastern Foundry, we're a, um, a co-working space, so similar to um, like a WeWork or Regis, if you've heard um, of those, but we are strictly for government contractors. <coughs> so we've got about 120 small to medium-sized government contractors that are members in both this location and we have another one in Crystal City. Um, so we're going quickly. Uh, we try to do events like this that can be tailored to some of our members. Um, if you're interested in learning any more information about getting involved with us or just learning more about Eastern Foundry, I will kind of be in the back throughout the event and at the end. Um, so feel free to, to come ask any questions, take any of our materials or anything. So thanks for coming. We're excited to have you guys. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Appreciate it. And uh, if you know somebody who's getting started in federal contracting, you know, tell them about Eastern Foundry. Uh, helping our sponsors help, helps us out. Uh, we are a community effort. See, uh, I'm the organizer, but I'm always looking for co-organizers. In the past, I've had some of my co-workers do this. I've delegated it to them because I couldn't make it. But it really can't be something that's just an not initiative. It has to be something that is you know, built from the community. So if you want to just do it part-time, maybe alternate once a month uh, you know, with me, uh, that's great. Or if you want to take on a specific role like membership coordinator or treasurer, um, it's a great way to meet people. You get to meet really smart people that want to speak. You get to smart, meet, meet people that come to our groups. Um, so I'd love to have more collaborators and volunteers with this group. Right, right, just mentioned. <laughs> uh, we, we're looking, always looking for sponsors and members, so we need help with that. Data Community DC is a larger group in DC. Uh, we are just one out of eight different communities. Our total group is probably north of 16,000 members at this point. Um, and you know, if you don't like what you see here in this group, please go check out one of the other groups. Um, so we, we focus specifically on data processing. Not necessarily a specific technology, uh, but rather the process of taking raw data, wrangling it, processing it, putting it into a clean enough format where then data scientists can create models and test their models on it, data analysts can look at it, data visualiz visualizers can make uh, apps that basically look at, make it look nice. Um, so if you have a topic related to data processing, I'd uh, love to have you come and speak. We have a couple of things coming up in June and July. Um, also, if you're graphically inclined and can make a better graphic than this PowerPoint process, uh, <laughs> I'll give you credit. Please, uh, looking for that. In our group, at this time, we'd like everybody to just get up, to physically get up, everybody just get up, and go talk to somebody you didn't talk to yet for two, three minutes. Just meet somebody new.
for you to share potentially your experience with what the person is talking about uh, or maybe show a dis different perspective. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a question, it just could be a comment that you know, adds to uh, the group's knowledge. Some other sponsors, so uh, Georgetown, uh, sorry, Georgetown, I'm a Georgetown student. Uh, <laughs> they steal our colors, excuse me. Uh, George Washington University is a great sponsor for uh, our group. We actually hold events at um, Hunger Hall uh, when we can, when there aren't classes available. And it's also a very convenient spot right off of the Foggy Bottom Metro. Um, if you're interested in this, just email analytics.gwu.edu. Um, and other, other uh, programs called Decision Analytics. It's basically a combination of business knowledge and data science uh, around how do you make better decisions. Uh, some of our sponsors, so TIPCO is actually here tonight and they're going to introduce uh, John. Um, uh, we'd love to have other sponsors. If you have a company um, or you have you know a friend's company or maybe where you work, uh, I'd love to have you sponsor a, an event, like just pay for pizza and drinks for one of these events. You can be also a program sponsor for three months and you know, we'll have you up here. Uh, this is a completely um, volunteer driven, donation driven system. Um, and what we don't get from sponsors, I make the short follow up for. So um, it'll continue regardless. Uh, we also, because we're part of the data community DC, we have dues to the parent group. Um, and I'm very transparent about how this thing works. So if you become a co-organizer, uh, you can help grow this and, and learn how this works. So. I'd uh, love to have you uh, attract more sponsors. Um, these are the organizational sponsors. So if you know somebody that can sign a really, really, really big check, uh, they can just sign it over to Rahul Singh. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, it would go to the parent group, and the parent group supports us in other ways. Um, and you know, some of them is to just manage the custodial uh, uh, system, such as bank accounts. You know, we have an assistant, uh, other program staff that helps us helps me do a better job of servicing you guys. So 15 second announcements. Uh, if you have a job that you're hiring for, if you have a meetup you would like to announce, um, hackathons coming up, conferences, <coughs> classes, and, just, and if you're looking for a job too, or if you're a contractor and you're looking for gigs, just get up and yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Brian Rotrick. I run the data integration practice at Excel Consulting. Uh, we are looking for uh, a lead for our BI uh, section. Um, we're always looking for uh, senior people who have knowledge for data integration, um, as well as DevOps people. So please come see me afterwards, and I'll catch you because we've been sponsored before, and we'll be glad to do it again. Awesome. Yeah, and Excel is a great member of the, the tech and, and meetup community. Uh, they, they have a lot of events out there uh, in Arlington, so thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Hi, I'm Ron. <laughs> Software development manager looking for engineers uh, at my company, and also we have a Scrum Master position open, so um, we have big data problems we're trying to solve, so lots of interesting things. If anyone's interested in hearing more, don't find me up again. Great. Yeah, at the, oh yeah, just a note. If you guys want to talk to these people uh, <laughs> after the meetup, you guys can meet over at the yellow logo that's directly behind you, um, near the entrance where you guys came in. All right, anyone else? Yep, go ahead. Hey, I'm John. Um, I guess yeah, my company is looking for job developers with AWS experience, have Splunk experience, and that's pretty much it. They're between Chantilly Reston and College Park. So. Great, excellent. Anyone else? I know there's a meetup. You guys want to announce the Neo4j? So May 25th, we have a meetup that's about uh, Neo4j. It's called Graph Databases. Baltimore, Washington, on the meetup yeah. site. 
It's kind of hard to find, but. And I'll also put it up on the, um, the meetup, our meetup site. Uh, with, you know, so there's a kind of oh, cool. co sponsor. Excellent. All good. Um, so uh, we're always, our company, Anand, is always looking to work with uh, people that have their own businesses to partner together. Um, right now, we're working with a fairly large federal client, and they are looking for Spark, Hadoop, Kafka, Spark Streaming, Cassandra people. Um, it's a really exciting project. I can't tell you more about it. <laughs> but I can orient you to the right place if you're looking for a job. All right. Let's see. Oh, um, I am starting a series of classes, and I hope the next instructor comes from this group. But we have a data engineering uh, study group. We meet uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. over at Google Hangouts. We're covering uh, Cassandra, and the goal is to get everybody that's in that group, that's about six of us right now, to get the uh, Apache Cassandra certification, and then eventually DSC, uh, Enterprise um, DSC certification. Um, and the next topic after that will be Spark with Databricks. Um, and I think we want to do some sort of graphing afterwards, so we'll talk with Eve later about that. Uh, but if you're interested in being a, a, an instructor or uh, just a member of the group to learn something, just get in touch with me. Our only requirement is that in a span of 13 <coughs> classes, you can't miss more than two or we kick you out. It's like a, you know, it's like a class that you pay for. Um, because we, we need people to be there every week. Um, otherwise, it's like catch up for everybody else. So get in touch with me after that, after the meetup. Um, next month's theme is search and knowledge management. I believe we have one speaker already. Um, but we're looking for somebody else to speak. I know that's my love, <laughs> but I don't want to speak on the topic because I've already spoken about it before. Uh, if anybody uh, has uh, maybe an introduction to somebody that could speak mm -hmm. on it, that'd be great. Um, <coughs> And in July, we want to talk about machine learning for data processing. Um, it's a wide topic, um, but you know, assisted, uh, self-directed, um, machine learning, whatever it may be. Uh, and I don't think we really care about the technology, like I mentioned earlier. If you can speak on the topic to show how to get from bad data to clean data, come, come talk. All right, so just get in touch with, uh, with me afterwards. So tonight, I'm um, going to have actually Tipco come and talk a little bit about themselves, because they're a sponsor, and then they're going to introduce uh, John. Hey, how's everyone doing tonight? So, uh, Daniel Elder from TIPCO. Uh, I'm the federal team. Here with me is Jay Padcar. He's our solutions architect. And in the back is uh, Alan Schaefer, who heads up the uh, state local department. Uh, so, TIPCO is a software company. Got started about 25 years ago uh, doing data integration. Uh, since then, we've acquired various companies uh, to do various things across uh, the scope of the software realm. So we do uh, integration, but we also do event processing. And also what brings us here today is our data analytics tool. Uh, it's called Spotfire. So uh, we actually have a sign-up sheet in the back uh, for people that are interested to learn more about Spotfire specifically. Uh, but if uh, integration is your, uh, your expertise, then we also have that as well. Um, so, you know, we'll have the sign-up sheet going around, but um, this is really a great space. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're looking forward to uh, seeing John's uh, presentation. So, uh, without further ado, John, he's the uh, Chief Hydrologist with uh, USGS uh, in Pennsylvania. So, I don't know if you do a round of applause. Or... Okay, I'm probably going to sit. I have a couple of slides, but to make it more interesting, I kind of have uh, some demos, so hopefully it all goes well. And I appreciate the promotion. I'm not the chief hydrologist. I am a, I am a hydrologist in <laughs> the U.S. Geological Survey, and I, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water here, but um, my disclaimer for, you know, a lot of questions that folks that are too technical is I'm not a programmer, um, although I dabble in it, you know, as the necessity goes with my work. So I'm going to show you today a, a variety of ways to access um, government data, in particular USGS data. Um, some of the products um, that we develop to make it easier for folks, and then some ways to explore that, explore that with um, open source and other software. So. So first off, I guess I should explain what Endless is. Um, actually, I raise my hands. I'm just curious, who's ever heard of USGS or the US Geological Survey? Okay. 
<laughs> it's usually not that that many many folks. But once you start mentioning topo maps and things, or if someone knows a stream gauge or something like that, so so that's what USGS stands for. Um, NWIS is our National Water Information System, and by the title here, I'm going to show you how to kind of some ways to get the data, retrieve it, and process it, and then um, visualize it. So. We have a different structure, but just to be general, I kind of put these four topical areas that we that we work in. So we have kind of an area in geology um, where we assess uh, natural resources. Um, we also, um, you know, every time there's an earthquake or something like that, you know, you hear something on the news um, about USGS, you know, um, giving information. And then I mentioned like our topographic maps historically, but we have a you know large amount of geospatial information um, in the geo or geography area. We have a biology area um, as well, um, where we assess you know um, animals and plants um, in, throughout the nation. And then the area that I'm in is the the water section. So, um, but the big take takeaway I guess is that there's a lot of information that's you know, this is all taxpayer dollars for the, the science we do, and all this is publicly available. So I'll speak on some examples with water, but in all of our sections, you know, all this data that we collect, we're doing our best to make it publicly accessible. And the bottom there notes is that we're not really a regulatory organization. We're basically an unbiased science organization to provide objective science to, you know, whether it's the government or state officials, or different groups. So we, we do um, monitoring, but we also do specific research in certain areas. Um, but people trust our our science to be, you know, objective. Um, that we're not, you know, biased in any form or fashion. So we're around the country. <coughs> we kind of historically been situated in states. Um, we're being grouped together um, in some areas, and we have national research programs like our NACWA program or our stream flow system. If you've seen the um, stream gauges, you know, in, in your neck of the woods, we have them all across the country. And then we have what are called our cooperative research program. So this is a mix of federal, state, and local partnerships where we will do individual studies. So we have, I think, when I looked last, we had about 1.6 million sites in our database. So not all those sites have a ton of information. One of them may have you know, one piece of information, but some of those sites have, have a ton of information. So we have a lot of data to be mined. And what you see here is, um, and it doesn't show up, I'll, I'll pull this map up in, a, in a, a live version of this map in a few minutes, but, but you can see the streams where we have stations. Not all of them are stream gauges, but maybe where we've actually collected a stream sample. And then you see actual um, groundwater sites where we measure either the wells or we measure the water quality of the water. So the types of data, the, the way we speak of it is we have continuous data and discrete data. So for the continuous side, it's, you know, it's a frequency of usually like 15 minutes or maybe even more. Um, and we serve this up as much as we can to, to the web. And here's an example of a stream gauge in, on the Delmarva where you see here uh, the discharge or the stream flow. And you can see here it's a very low cubic feet per second, which it could be gallons per minute or whatever units you, you'd like to convert it to. But here you can just see, you know, here's the effects of irrigation actually in this stream. And then the, the, the flow goes back to normal, then irrigation again. And then here you see the effects of a storm in the hydrograph, and then the recession of the hydrograph as it comes along. So we measure not only flow, but also the water quality in, on a lot of our stations. So in blue here is the specific conductance, and that's something we measure to kind of get an idea of the total dissolved constituents in the water. So you can see here that the, the dissolved constituents are um, you know, at, a, at a pretty higher level um, until this storm happens. And then you get the rainwater in there that dilutes it, and then it brings, brings that water quality parameter down. And then what follows along with that is another sensor that we have employed, um, nitrate. So you can see that that actually falls right in line with the specific conductance, because that's one of the major dissolved constituents in that, in that stream. So that's an example of continuous data, like every 15 minutes, live, served up to the web. 
And then there's a bunch of discrete data. So I mentioned sometimes we just have a specific research question where we go out and try to answer things. And here's a small watershed um, on the Delmarva as well. And these are just sort of a one-time snapshot of collecting um, uh, nutrient samples. And in this case, you see uh, nitrate samples that were collected on this stream, and this stream, and that stream. So these eventually all get published in um, USGS reports or other peer-reviewed reports. But all this data, like I mentioned, is available on the web for folks. What, so you're, you're saying that if you guys get data every 15 minutes, it gets processed and it gets put out for the for the public every 15 minutes? Or what's the frequency that it gets out there? Um, that's a good question. It, there, there is a little bit of a time delay, but mm -hmm. it's pretty much real time. So it's, you know, I, I believe it's like within a half hour transmission wow. or even, you know, let's, let's say that. Because a lot of these streams, there's, you know, there's, there's flooding going on. So if, if, if People need to know real time, and yeah. So in those cases, yeah, it's, it's pretty much real time. This is what you're, what you're getting. Wow. Um, some some data like this that's more of a snapshot. It'll maybe there's an approval process, you know. So a lot of data will be shown up on the web, but it'll be flagged as provisional, um, and then it'll get a you know officially approved or something like that. But usually it doesn't change. Usually the data we collect is of good quality. So. What is the nitrogen isotope? I mean, what, is that, what does that indicate? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, in, this, in this study, so this is an area where we were, were curious not only um, to find, you know, we, we know there was high levels of nitrate in the system, but we'd like to see maybe where it's coming from. And you can use the isotopic composition of nit nitrate. So looking at the sort of the ratio of the nitrogen isotopes and the oxygen isotopes, can kind of give you some idea of maybe if it's more from a fertilizer source or if it's coming from a manure source or something like that. And that's one of multiple parameters we look at to try to help um, you know, farmers or research managers target their conservation practices. So you get different isotopes, say, like from the atmosphere versus like from the ground? Is that, is that Correct. Like, like fertilizer will have a different signature of um, isotopic composition of nitrate isotopes or um, nitrogen and oxygen isotopes versus like say manure or septic. So if you're trying to figure out where the nutrient problems are in in a small watershed or some area like that, you can use these techniques to kind of help tease out and then offer this information to resource managers so they're spending their money wisely and working on you know maybe cleaning up the septics in the area versus the fertilizer or vice versa or something like that. So. <coughs> That's a good question. I can answer that. That's, 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 that's why it's a good one. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to jump to just doing some live stuff, and I'm crossing my fingers that um, the web and the links work, everything. So what I wanted to show you first was, you know, how to find sites. Um, there's <coughs> this um, site mapper that we have with USGS, and I'll show you a, a mobile version here. But this was kind of that, that uh, map that I showed you before where you basically can see all our surface water sites, you know, stream sites. And right now I just have clicked on the active sites. And then if I click on active sites for groundwater, um, they show up as well. So let me zoom in real quick to my neck of the woods in Pennsylvania. So we got a lot of sites. Um, let's see here. There's the active, the active sites. <coughs> Bring on the groundwater sites. So depending on maybe what you're interested in looking at, um, this is a good way to search for that information. And then, you know, there's, there's a particular site. Like here's one I'll kind of highlight. Um, straight run. If you want to and see in particular what kind of data that has, you know, you can click on here and you can get an idea of the period of record. You know, this is a very small watershed. You can actually go to see if there is current um, observations being collected. This will take you to the website where you can, and if you kind of see our USGS gauges, they have this format where you can see the different hydrographs, be it uh, stream flow or water quality parameters. I jump back here. So here's a study that um, 
that just collected the samples last summer, but we have a bunch of groundwater data that's now available for this for this county in uh, in Pennsylvania. So likewise, you can go here and you can click and you can access the data and get get an idea of um, you know what's what's available. So the if you want to use you know, maybe your iPad or something like that, um, there's a mobile viewer, which is basically the same thing. It has a little bit different format. You can set up like use my local location. So far so good. I'll be honest. <laughs> so it zooms in where we're at, and you can see all the steering gauges or the our observation wells. And then here has a similar type of thing where you can click on maybe active sites, you know, where, where you want. So that, that's a, a start, you know, maybe you're in an area and, you know, you or someone you're working for is doing a, doing a study and, you know, you're going to collect data. You might, you might want to just check out our database to see if we have, you know, sites, you know, even if they're archive sites where there's, you know, existing information before you start from scratch. So, as far as accessing the data, so say you have a site or two or multiple sites and you'd, you'd like to access the data, we have basically, I'm not in PowerPoint mode here, sorry about that. We basically have two, um, two ways, um, there's multiple ways, but you know, one of the main or traditional ways is our endless web, and I'll click on that. Um, what, but what most folks here might be interested in is some of the new ways of trying to serve up uh, information to the public, and this is the Endless Web Services. So, with Endless Web, you can go to um, Water for the Nation, and you can click and search in multiple ways, and here you see a little map. It's kind of colored with, you know, if there's flooding potentially going on in certain areas. And if you click on, say, Pennsylvania, you know, this is just another way to kind of find that data that, that you need. And I'll just click on the site here. So blue just means that it's 90 percentile of like, all water flow. <clears throat> yeah, that it, 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 it could be, you know, some of the highest flow that we're seeing in there, there it's in that 90th percentile. So it's local to the area, but not to, to America, regional America. It's the 90th percentile, I mean? Yeah. It's for that um, data for that stream. For that sensor. Yeah, the, okay. the stream flow that they're measuring on that stream. Oh. So it's like the, the data we're seeing here is at the 90th percentile. Okay, right now I got you. For these different. So here's a, here's a site, um, Susquehanna River at Tawanda. We actually have some live webcams at, at sites as well, which is, is something new. But a couple ways you can access data. Um, you can not only get the hydrograph, which I showed you there, but you could, you could get a tabular format. So you could kind of do a web scraping, you know, through a script and get it this way possibly. Um, and if you go back to, um, if you go back to here, you can also uh, build a query, um, and I'm not going to show it because I, I'd like to highlight the other one for time's sake, but you can build a query on basically what parameters you want, what sites you want, and it kind of does a static pull of that, of that information. Um, but what I think might be most interested to folks is some of our new services. They're kind of in beta, but they, they work pretty well, where you can do the same thing. You can set up you know, what sites you want, what parameters you want, but you can create a live link to the data in a sense. So you can, import that into your code so if we ever get new data or if it's a continuous site where we have every 15 minutes you know it's, it's feeding in that new data for you so this is really what you know we've, we've uh, are highlighting and using more and more and I'll give you I'll show you an example of that here so if you have um, go take the station number for this site So basically, in the USGS web services, just you can go through some different um, various filters for the data. You can plug in the station number that you would like. Um, 
and then how you would like the data. So we have some different formats. Um, we have Water ML, which is a markup language that's being used more and more to have a common standard of water throughout the world. So USGS is using it. I think Australia, um, Canada, maybe Europe is using it now. Um, so you could get it in that format. You could get it in that sort of tab delimited format that I showed uh, before, um, which will kind of give you like an Excel column format. So there's a couple different options to, to pull the data. And then you could really fine tune it, you know, how, how you like, you know, with these other parameters. But in the end, what's nice is you can generate a URL. So this URL, you would only have to do this whole, uh, set up this query once. You know, once you create this URL, you could, if you can see here, I know it's kind of hard to see in the background, but basically it, it has the site number that you wanted, the parameters you want, and, you know, that's all set. And then basically generate that URL. And in this case, we, we did a tab delimited, and it'll pull the data for you. And that's the stream, so it would, up, it would update in like the next 15 minutes. Because it's like, I want the date on there, you know, 1845 or whatever. Correct, yeah. Um, I have a question. Like so, here's, go ahead, sorry. So, do you have like a separate API, or is this like what you're using for your API? Because I saw you the JSON. Um, format also. I don't know if anybody else saw that. So you don't need a key or anything to get like this information or? A key, like a code you mean? Or yeah, like an API key or something. No, I think it's just open. It's just open, yeah. open? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's just, just you know, open to the public. Because the, the, the old version I kind of showed, which is still being used, the endless web system, you could go in and get the data kind of in a stagnant format. But, yeah, but it's being served up now where you can just use that URL and, and get that data. So, And I'll show you some examples of some software and um, actually an R package that one of our scientists created where you can do the same thing. That hopefully makes it easier. So, so yeah, so if, if you remember anything of tonight, you might want to fool around with web services. That's a really um, a great um, view. And I'm just going to show a couple different formats. We um, we we use a lot of open source products. Um, <coughs> we've developed some of our software, or um, we use some other software to develop some of our um, different programs that we we run and use. So I'll just give you a couple quick examples. Like so, for the R programming language um, and with incorporating other open source languages, there's a couple different things that are available through our software libraries, but I'm going to highlight this tool here. Um, this was developed by our scientist Bob Hirsch, um, USGS Data Retrieval for R, and it's available on GitHub. So basically, it's an R package, and I'll show you. I'm not going to run the program, but I'll show you basically the output in Knitter. Um, how it looks. So once you run this data retrieval package, you load the library, um, I mentioned we have continuous and discrete data. You know, it's pretty easy to write some code to, you know, specify the site that you would like, um, the parameters. So in this case, you can see we're trying to get uh, discharge or stream flow, and then this is the parameter number for specific conductance, and then the date that we need it. And then you just run that, um, you quickly view if this is the data that, you, that you're looking for, and then in just a couple more lines of code in R, you can basically start producing some data visualizations. So here's just a graph of specific conductance and discharge at this site, and you can kind of see something similar where you, know, you have discharge, and then in this discharge going up and then conductance going down. So you can basically create a, a live feed, you know, or, or specify the dates that you want. A couple more lines of code can give you a box plot of, you know, the discharge for this period, specific conductance. Are these examples on that GitHub uh, page, that GitHub site? This is one that I just created for you guys just oh, okay. to, to see, but um, gotcha. um, 
But yeah, there's, there's there are some, other examples. There are some examples here. So that's continuous data. And as far as discrete data, um, so I measured specific conductance kind of gives you an over um, idea of sort of the dissolved constituents in the water. But if you wanted to look at particular um, major ions that are in the water, things like um, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, alkalinity, sulfate, chloride, and nitrate, basically you can pull this same data you know, by the parameter codes, you know, format it to um, you know, being numeric, you know, make some calculations, and then produce some graphs to get an idea you know, if on certain dates if these constituents were higher or lower or anything like that. So obviously there's much more robust things you can do in R, but um, this data retrieval package you know, hopefully would help you facilitate getting this data from USGS uh, much quicker. So I'll show you as well. So I don't know if any of you ever heard of our Sparrow. Um, it's a model we use basically to um, try to develop some spatial regressions of um, nutrients and other contaminants across a, a watershed. And I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, um, but there is an online tool that you can use. But I guess my, my point um, is, is that a lot of that same um, you know, languages you can use in um, scripting, you can use to pull the data and bring this data into whether it be ArcGIS, um, in this case ArcGIS and SAS, to kind of do some modeling. So, in this case, you see we're pulling in um, and doing some modeling and some calculations on nitrogen um, yields. You can also look at nitrogen loads around the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So you can see areas where there's much more higher yields of nitrogen that are contributing to the, to the bay. So tools like this can help, again, resource managers kind of figure out where they may want to spend their dollars, like maybe in you know, southern Pennsylvania versus northern Pennsylvania or something like that. So, so SAS and, um, uh, and ArcGIS, and they're actually developing the Sparrow model as a, an R version that'll be um, open source as well. They're very useful for uh, handling the data. Um, SAS makes another product called uh, Jump. Um, which has been a very handy product. And I can show you an example. Here's the code for it. Okay, so, so here you see um, what we call a stiff plot. And it's just a kind of a way to look at the geochemistry. And I mentioned some of the major constituents in water, magnesium, calcium, sodium, and potassium, being the cations. And then you also have the anions. And if you sort of graph them on this bar chart on the side, you can see in this case for this one water sample that there there's, seems to be a little more calcium and there seems to be you know, a decent amount of bicarbonate. And this kind of helps us characterize this uh, groundwater sample as a calcium bicarbonate sample. But what's powerful, um, and I kind of showed you some of the coding behind it, so you can start pulling in a lot of data. And for me, that for someone who's been working in USGS for about 10 or so years, um, it's just amazing where we've come with being able to handle data. But if you look at, you know, not only just doing this site, you know, here's all the sites for my project. So you can see here, I can quickly view that looks like there's a lot of calcium bicarbonate water in this, in this area or this aquifer. You know, it seems the things change. There's some sodium and chloride that come into water, you know. But what's neat is if you have the script set up right, you can zoom out and say, well, okay, well, this is one county. What does the adjacent counties look like? And you can just, you can see this. You know, it's pretty powerful to kind of quickly visualize, like, okay, it seems like in this area of northern Pennsylvania, 
these water types are very similar, or in some areas they're they're not. So, um, so these various softwares, coupled with you know some of the, the tools that we're developing for generating the data, is is very very powerful. You can do a lot more statistical stuff and obviously R and jump. Um, so I'll show you some similar examples in um, Spotfire. And I think I highlighted this one site here, um, straight run. But if I jump back to how you like traditionally see the, the data on the web, You know, you and the public, you know, like this is great. You got one site, you can see what's going on. But what if there's like five sites in the same watershed, in the same drainage area? You'd like to see if, you know, if they're affecting each other. Or what if you'd like to see all the sites around, you know, this part of this area? This is where, you know, using some of those retrieval methods I showed you and pulling, pulling the data in, you can um, do that pretty easy. And do this right here. So here's an example of basically pulling in um, about 70 different sites worth of data. It's the last seven days of continuous data every 15 minutes. And this is for northern Pennsylvania, which has the Delaware Basin um, and the Susquehanna Basin. And I can quickly see here, you know, all these sites. So I don't have to go to multiple sites, have things printed out. But I can see, like, in this one watershed, you know, it, okay, it seems like the, the river level's coming up higher here, coming down lower there. Um, you know, and, and one feature that's nice is you can have, uh, you know, live feeds of the maps, but you can also have live feeds of the weather on top of it. So you could do something like, you know, put the weather map on here, and then, you know, is this site in particular starting to see getting hit? You know, or is there a time delay in what, what we're seeing in the stream with the discharge coming up? Um, here, down here, you can see where we have precipitation in areas. So, you know, even though it looks like there's a lot of clouds and rain there, did we actually get precip, precip, precip in that area? So, it's just amazing in one view what you can see, you know, versus kind of clicking through that one spot and trying to... So, so did you configure Spotfire to pull data directly from those web services? Is that how you're accessing this information? I guess you can do that, but no, I, I did that more through some of the ways that I that I that I showed you guys through some scripting. And okay. then Spotfire just points to a um, a file. So, okay, I see. So, so, like, so yeah, you use R to do kind of the correct. The, okay, yeah. Gotcha. So I just rerun the script and I have it kind of set up where, you know, just rerun the script as soon as I turn on my computer and then um, if I open any software, you know, it'll it'll point to that one file, and I have the most updated information. Because okay. there's multiple softwares we use, and in USGS we don't promote any particular software because each one kind of has a certain tool. Like like R is a very good statistical um, tool. Um, SAS is as well. Uh, they're all very helpful. So um, another quick example of water levels. Um, so I mentioned we have um, groundwater wells where we measure water levels, so this helps you know resource managers figure out if there's droughts happening or anything like that. And the same thing, they're kind of on one page where you have to look at it. So if you can get savvy with pulling in this, this data, you can see here for this one site, um, you can see that for the whole period of record, um, from 1975 to 2015, you have up and downs you know, during the water um, year where things get dry and low between the summer and the winter and things like that. You could draw a trend line to see if things are trending over time. Here um, you can see a hydrograph of just the last year if you're just curious like how this compares to the trend. Here you can see the water level by month. So for the whole period of record, you know, it seems like through January and February things are lower, but things get higher in September. And then this heat map is nice, um, something similar I've done in Jump and SAS. You can look at um, basically from 1976 up to 2016, and from January to December, um, you know, the gray areas kind of show where things are drier, you know, and then um, blue shows us things are wetter. So, you know, in particular years, maybe 
Like in 2011, in this area in particular, we had uh, a big Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Lee, you know, was a particular wet year. So that's kind of a, an outlier, you know, in the data that you can see. But in one quick graphic, you can basically see the whole period of record, um, which is pretty, pretty handy. And I'll just show you quickly, um, if you set it up right, you can basically bring in all the sites within Pennsylvania or all the sites in the country and just flip through them. So in this case here, um, a little bit of a time delay, but you know, I, I was showing you a Bucks County site, but these are other sites around the state, and you can quickly go through and you know, see the data and explore it um, and understand it better and develop trends. So like here, I showed you that linear regression over time, if there was a trend, you can kind of see maybe in some areas, you know, the trend is up or the trend is down. Um, so that's, that's some examples of you know, how you can explore the data. And then one other quick example I have, um, kind of the same idea where you can have like a snapshot. Um, like in this in this case here, um, it's just kind of a dashboard of our discrete data. So I mentioned this study in um, Bradford County, Pennsylvania. You can see we sampled about 72 wells. And you know I can quickly view it in tabular form. I have a, a pie chart here for this parameter and I can see if there's any detections. Um, here you can actually see the dots, they're weighted. So in this case, this is arsenic levels in Bradford County. So you can see, you know, there's a few wells that have some higher values than other values. You know, 86% of the wells are actually, there's no detections. Um, and then here you can kind of compare one county versus another, you know, like in a box plot or something like that. And then here I have a time series. So you can, you can obviously create this, whatever is more useful for you, but this is very useful for me because I can go through um, you know, not only look at arsenic, but I can type in here dissolved oxygen or something, and um, you know, quickly view dissolved oxygen levels around there. So I can, you know, in one sense, kind of view if I see anything that's like maybe following along the geology, if there's anoxic or oxic zones or things like that. So. That's all I have, really. I, I guess the main point I hope is that um, we have a lot of data out there, and uh, it's a very exciting time to be in because it's becoming more and more accessible um, for, for folks. And we, I think, especially with the data that we've collected for so long, and that is trusted data, um, it can be really useful to pull together in a fashion to make you know informed decisions. So. Um, do you have a directory of web services available? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I could send you a link maybe if the folks want, um, you know, <coughs> an email or something like that. I can yes. follow yes. up with you guys. Yeah. John, if you send it to me, I'll put it in the comment section for tonight's talk, and yeah. I'll put all the, the links up there. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll put yeah. useful links. Um, yeah. um, and another question, quick question. Sure. Um, water ML. You mentioned about water ML. So you have the schema also as documentation for the water ML. Uh, the water ML is no. not developed by us, oh, um, and I'm not an expert in that myself. But um, there's a group I think called Kawashi. It's like a uh, a group of hydrologists that are putting together this effort of creating this markdown language that can be used across you know um, areas. So because you know there's just examples of like um, a governor or someone saying, okay, I, what's going on with the water and the data is in all these different formats. So it's just becoming more and more of a need to have it in a, in a similar standards and format so the data can be pulled easily. Mm -hmm. But USGS is yeah. one of the scenes. They also have it in JSON. I think that was one of the formats. Yeah, yeah so, the JSON. So you can pull oh. the data as JSON format. But, but still, do you have a like a data glossary of explanation of those, you know, even in JSON yes. though? Okay. Um, actually, if you go when you go through that query, like I said, there was a question mark on each one of them, and if you push on the question mark, it'll lead you to glossaries of like what our, all our parameter codes are, okay. or, or things like that. So, okay. um, Thank you. there's a little description up top. So, sorry, I, pr I probably went quick through that because I'm used to seeing that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thanks.
You mentioned you had a lot of data. How far back does your data go? Um, <coughs> I don't know off the top of my head. Um, you know, it depends on sites, obviously. Um, but yeah, we. I mean, some of our stream flow data goes back into the 1800s, and, you know, late 1800s, anyway. Um, but you know, more recently, like say with our quality data, like we have very good data for the last 30 years, 20, 30 years, or something like that. You know, obviously we get more and more data the last couple decades, but but it just depends on the parameter. You know, like there's emerging contaminants that are just being of concern now that we never sampled for in the past or something like that. But and it's good that you mentioned the data dictionary or when if you are exploring our data, um, it's helpful to get used to the codes because we have different medium codes you know, being either groundwater or it could be a QA sample. Um, there's different method codes, so you might be measuring something like nitrate, and the lab is using two different codes. So some, it's useful to just um, not only look at the raw result value you're, you're getting, but also the, the codes that go with it, because it's not always um, apples to apples with the data. You know, if you're looking at something that's 20, 30 years ago, and the lab was using a different method, and there's a much more improved method. You know, you might see this trend, but it may be really just an artifact of a change in the lab. So it's, it's useful to just pay attention to the coding that we have. But that's one thing we strive ourselves on, and we have a good database for that. Too. I think there's a lot of potential. Um, you know, I've spoken with a lot of people in the Internet of Things space that I want to focus on with the agriculture. And um, you know, they always talk about needing data to prove their model. Mm -hmm. And you have all this sample data for a year that they yep. can test their model on. Yep. It's awesome. Well, on that point too, do you have a process in place for handling public interest and monitoring a new area that currently has no data? That currently what has? Has no data, so a stream or whatever it might be that's currently not monitored. Yeah, um, so that's the kind of two different research areas. We have our national research and local research. So we have what I mentioned is the NACWA program. So that kind of gets some direct funding from Congress. And they're always looking at specific questions of need, like certain aquifers on the coastal plain that you know may be um, depleting and be a concern for drinking water in the future. So they'll be studying that that study unit for a while. So they have certain <coughs> questions, and then there's other projects where we have more local things, like that Bradford County example. Um, like for instance, the whole northern tier of Pennsylvania, there wasn't really a ton of groundwater data available there. And until recently, there's been more interest in private well owners understanding their, their well water quality. So we've recently gotten funding from local groups. But it's like anything. It's, it, it all depends on, on the funding and the interest. But, but we try to balance the, what we know is good science and what information is mm -hmm. needed with you know, the funding opportunities and stuff like that. Because we we're not fully funded by Congress like straight. So we actually get funding from other sources. So which is good because we don't just study just for the sake of studying. We, we, it's directly tied to a need that the state of Pennsylvania or some, someone has for studying. So we're, we're constantly trying to fill in those gaps, like you're, you're saying. That was the challenge. All right, and uh, just one more question, and then we'll go to the next speaker. Yeah, go. If there was a project that someone completely outside USGS did with the data, what would, what would be your like ultimate I'm happy to see someone did that with the data project. <laughs> like if um, if they collected data? If know? they used the web services for a, a data exploration project, whatever, what, what would your like, if, if someone came back for <coughs> a year and said, hey, I used your data, what would be the happiest thing for you to hear? Or what would I, make you I, I think this is an exciting time because it's kind of a, like a full menu. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's Tons of stuff. I mean, obviously, it might be helpful to do a literature search on what things we've done with the data and stuff like this. But um, the, I mentioned these projects. Like sometimes we're studying this this one county here, and, and someone else is studying another county here in New York. But um, we don't have the resources to, you know, well, what if we combine that data and, and see what that looks like? You know what I mean? So sometimes we just focus on this one research question, but when you're data mining it and, and looking at it, so. Um, yeah, I can't think of one example. I could probably think of hundreds, you know what I mean? That there's t tons of opportunities once you kind of get looking at the data. So yeah, that'd be great if, uh, you know, somebody took this data and, and created 
something and then I don't know if you guys have a gallery on the GIF GIF website where you show other people leveraging the data right now. Um I have to ask. Um I'm not sure. That would be that would be really I mean good because it's we, we like to see I mean there is data, we have data behind who's using our data. Do you have blogs or anything that maybe people um, their work on? Yes, um, we do. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to look into it. We have so many different things on our website, I'm not you know, privy to them all. And there's a colleague of mine here that's leading our transition from kind of the old endless to the new endless that could make it tonight. But I'm going to mention his group to you because I think he would, he actually works out in Reston now. So he would um, be very interested in coming and meeting you guys in the future as well. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I don't, I'll, I'll have to remember if this is the right, place, right site, but. There's a company called Satori, and there's something called the Satori Challenge, where they have public data feeds, and their challenge is to take existing public data feeds that are not in the Satori format, which is a stream format, and, and provide it. And this would be a, an excellent um, uh, use case, because you have potentially data from across the country coming in in every 15 minutes. Right, and it's, it's too right. much for us to analyze sometimes. Yeah. I mean, there could be trends and things that are just... Right. right, but they provide a platform that you can basically aggregate it put it out in one continuous format and do some data analysis with that. So, But I'll, if I find the link in my Evernote, I'll put that on the comments as well. Well, everybody, let's give John a, a, a round of applause. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Timothy Hathaway. And um, Timothy, actually, uh, I met him Last year at a data left wranglers group, um, he will be speaking on a different type of uh, government data, um, SEC information. Um, but um, <coughs> make sure that you are all up in the next year. The best part is, is that my laptop died this morning, so I'm using his Mac. So it's going to be comedy all night long if I can close it by mistake. Yeah. Let me close the other PowerPoint that you don't need. That's it. It like went away. I saw it there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Why don't we get the store? Why don't you just start? Yeah, uh, my name's Tim Hathaway. I've worked for many years with political groups. Basically what I do is I sit down with campaigns, uh, put flash fees and such as a consultant, and I help them manage their flow of data. Uh, lots of times it's about money, how does money come into an organization, how does it get properly reported. Sometimes it's voter data. Um, it's an interesting job, you get to sit in the war room, you get to see how the sausage is made, which is horrifying sometimes, but it's actually really interesting other times. Um, but it gets old, because you just run around from group to group, reinventing the wheel, saving one group at a time, and frankly, it gets old after a while. So what I decided at some point was that I had to move from offering services, which is me dealing with one client or maybe a handful of clients, to offering products. Now, as anybody will tell you who's gone from services to products, that's a completely, completely different animal. So he wanted me to take a couple minutes and talk about that uh, before we really start talking about data. Um, in addition, uh, to get into the database, there's going to be a live uh, graph database demo at the end. If you have your laptop, I'll have the URL, username, and passwords if you want to get in and run the queries with me and play with it and such, if you've never, if you've never played with that technology. Um, weird situation that I've never been in is PowerPoint has decided to completely hide 
his PowerPoint deck. So, um, but I will get it to work. Too. Okay. Um, so, like I said, in the in the past, I've worked with campaign, and that's all good and well. Um, the biggest problem for me was not moving from services to products. What everyone else says, like you know, clients that they want documentation and training and support and all these things that you never had to do before because you were on site, you were actually running the software. But the biggest problem for me was sales. Because for me, sales, when you're, a con when you're a consultant, you have a reputation. Once the campaign ends and you're unemployed, your, your phone goes off in a week or two and it says, hey, can you come down and, you know, can you help us out with such and such? It's not a problem. The problem is, is that when you're selling to people, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and that's really disturbing and kind of not good because, the, because they get so many people reaching out there. How many people get those emails that say, hey, I wanted to follow up on our conversation. You're like, I've never talked to you before. Or they, you know, they put the re colon, making them think that you're replying to, they're replying to your email. So I decided I was going to go down, and as a good data person and trying to be logical, is that I was going to go down and find the sales book that taught me how to do all this stuff. Because there's got to be a book, right? There has to be a book. Okay. So I go down to go down to Barnes and Noble. It's just it's like from me to that couch of just books on sales. And so my first funny slide is where I actually went on Amazon because I realized that if there's that many books, it means none of them have the answer. But if you go on Amazon and you look for books that have the word sex in them. And you, go for, and you go to Amazon and look for books that have the word sales in them, there's 4.6 times more books that have the word sales in them. <laughs> so, so that tells you that you don't really have anything you can fall back on. Right? There's no prescribed best practices. So you have to kind of sit down and you have to have the, you know, you have to have the meeting with yourself. What is it that I'm going to build my sales process around? And so I look, 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 and finally it, it all comes down to who knows who. doesn't matter. I mean, marketing is good. You know, support is good. Reputation, advertising, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's all about who knows who. If I want to sell you something and you don't know who I am, but you know who she is, and I know who she is, if I know that I know her and I know that she knows you, I'm going to call her to get her to set up the meeting with you. Because that's all, that's all that matters is I have to get in front of you and show you what I'm selling. It doesn't matter what the marketing is if I can't actually demo it to someone who's going to make a decision or at least champion the product up the, uh, up the, up the chain. So, you, you know, as a data person, again, now that I've stopped looking for books, I'm looking for data. How do I go ahead and run the sales operation? Well, you go to LinkedIn, because that is the that is the graph database that's supposed to be able to give you this stuff. Well, there's a lot LinkedIn's a great product. I use it, I use it often, but it's got a lot of problems. First of all, not everybody has a LinkedIn profile, especially people who are like senior decision makers. Number two, they're not always up to date. I mean, there are people who have been in companies that I know have went out of business several years ago. <laughs> uh, there are, let's face it, people are lying on their LinkedIn profile. Uh, so I basically said, well, I can't use this. I need to go ahead and I need to find the data. I'm, I'm selling into the political space. I need to find data where it's mandatory and that shows me the strength of the relationship. Because LinkedIn, hey, if I've known you for 20 years and if, I, and if we're on LinkedIn and if I've known you for two minutes and we're on LinkedIn, the outside world would say it's the same relationship. So where did I get that data? I said, well, hell, I'm going to pull it down from the FEC because I've spent all these years helping clients push data into the FEC. Now I'm going to start. Help, I'm going to help myself by pulling data out of the FEC. Are we up? What's the okay. FEC? Okay. So what's what's oh, the FEC? FEC, the Federal Election Commission. Anybody who goes ahead and plays in politics, who spends any money, has to file financial reports, which are very complicated. But basically, it counts two things: where the money come from, who the money go to. And for this, I'm primarily interested in where the money went to. So that's going to show me all the vendor relationships. So I can go ahead and work my way to the campaign, who is who I really want to talk to. Sorry, do you have a hand? So, um, in someone sets up a nonprofit, it's anonymous, right? When they donate money to a politician, at least through the FTC's perspective, how do you track something like that? If I have 100 nonprofits, no one's ever going to know who I am. Yeah, but unless you spend money, well, okay, I'm not an attorney, but I will tell you, that, and this is going to be an answer to a lot of these questions, is that if you spend money in the form of an independent expenditure as a nonprofit group, you will file a form, uh, Schedule 56 or 57 for raising money. Now, there are all kinds of caveats, and, and it changes constantly, and I am not aware of the annals that, but I can get a pretty good idea of where the money's going within the nonprofits. And also, frankly, nonprofits are spending big checks. I'm worried of, I think, and that, so there's not a lot of relationships there. I'm looking more at the campaigns that have 100 vendors, so the nonprofit that's got three vendors. Okay, now, has anybody here ever worked with FEC data before I shoot off my mouth anymore? Okay, all right, good. Oh, I got three. All right, I'm in trouble. 
Okay, so let me go ahead. Now this is my this is my funny slide about sales and sex. So and I did the math for you there at the bottom. So we go ahead and we say, okay, how does the uh, how does this how does this data get put together? Okay. Now now these slides are intentionally bad. Okay, I want you to know that. Uh, if you've ever worked on a campaign before and you've seen the hell that is the close of a campaign finance reporting session, you will understand what that poor person on the far side is doing. Because they're filing on a monthly or a quarterly basis all of their books and they're using software to do it. Now, the software is very interesting. You can get commercial packages that will do it. You, the FEC will give you a free package, which is so-so, but it gets the job done. You can go ahead and you can write your custom stuff. Most of the big presidentials write their own custom code. And, hey, you know what, you want to file your reports with Notepad? You can go ahead and do it. I'll show you how in the future. Um, but, the, but the problem is, the Achilles heel of the system, which we'll come back to, is that all of the people who are on the far side, they're not data people necessarily. They're putting the data in to the software that itself is interpreting the specification that the FEC is providing. The FEC has three dozen forms and schedules, it has six different. It has six different revisions of the spec. So when I got out the spec, I brought a prop because everything requires a prop. This is the specification for the data for campaign spending and and uh, and uh, contributions. So there's a couple other problems. In it, okay, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this. Now, next time a politician comes to you and says, "My God, we need to raise more money because of such and such," if you are a Senate campaign, you put all your data into that software. You print out a paper report, and you mail it to the FEC. I'm not making this up. Now, I exaggerate a little bit with the trash can. The FEC does attempt to key punch that data, but they do not get the data, they do not have as much visibility into that data because it's gone through the paper process as everybody else going up to the FEC servers, as you can see. Um, so you can see that we're not going to be able to deal with all of the data that is, that is possible. So, we toured through the data. We toured through how the data is created. Now let's look at an actual report. Now, okay, if anybody wants to get in on the laptop and use FTP, if anybody still uses that, um, all of the reports are available on the FEC. You notice on the far right hand side they are zipped by all reports by date. Okay, within each of those is a text file. An FEC report is nothing but a text file properly delimited in format. So, I'm sorry, any questions so far? Okay. So this is what a report looks like. Okay. And I'm going to do some pointing here, so I'll probably get out of camera range. Um, the first record is the header record. This tells me what version of the spec I'm working with. Okay. I don't just use data from like six months ago going forward. I've taken data going all the way back to version 6.3 which I think is 10 years old, because I do a lot of work with historical data. So this, be this becomes a problem. This is very interesting to me. I also like the fact it's got the name of the software that produced it, because that allows me to control for individual idiosyncrasies within the software. It also tells me who's working for whom, so that's kind of interesting too. Um, the second record, okay? You would think that was important. It's really not. That tells me who's following the port, which is good. But the rest of it is all just summary data, like you know, how much money I raised in total, what's the date coverage range for this report, blah, blah, blah. Now, the next one, this is where it gets interesting. You'll see it starts SA, and then now you get SB. SA, Schedule A, receipts, money that comes into the system. Okay. SBs, disbursements, money going out of the system. And there are other ones, but this is 90% of your battlefield right here. Um, you'll see it's delimited, going left to right, uh, and you'll see that we've really got the juicy stuff in here. We've got the name of we've got the name of the vendor, Facebook, <coughs> paychecks, that sort of thing. Individuals, I can see who's on payroll. All right, addresses, so I can do geographic distributions. The amount of disbursement, the date of the disbursement, and all the way on the other side, the purpose of the disbursement. Oh my God, this stuff's fantastic. All right. It also goes ahead, and on the far left, you'll see that it says SB, and there are different line numbers. All right? The different line numbers are different types of disbursements, just like SA has different line numbers. If the money came from an individual, that's an SA 11 AI. Okay? There are different lines for whether or not it came from another political committee, if it came from a PAC, if it came from an organization. Really interesting stuff. 
So this is, this is basically the data that we download from the FEC. This is a raw report as it is submitted. The FEC has cleansed, the FEC has different ways of bringing data. I like to work with the raw data because I don't understand how the FEC has cleansed it. It's not a judgment on how they cleanse it, but I would never understand it. So I'd rather work with the raw data and understand all of this in your signature. Questions so far? Okay. So we go ahead and what we do, and this is unsexy in the extreme, is we have a piece of software that runs 24-7 in Azure. It's a C-sharp app. Basically what it does, and okay, just so you know, he's not sitting on a toilet. Somebody asked me that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay? that, just, that, that was not an editorial comment, although that would be genius. Okay. So we monitor for changes to the FEC's uh, RSS feed, which is where they publish that a new report has come in. All right. When, it, when we see that there's a change, we pull the report down, we ship it up to Azure, we go ahead and we parse it out. We parse the report tedious, very tedious. Nobody, nobody ever wrote parsing code like this and felt like a genius afterwards. Okay? We take the header record, which is what you saw in the first record, and we take the schedule information, we dump that purely relationally into SQL Server. We, we do very little cleansing of it. What, we, what we're basically doing with this is we're standardizing all the different versions. Because I can have disbursements not just on Schedule B. I can have Schedule E, Schedule F57. I don't really care about that. What I want to do is get it all into one table. This is the, soft, this is the software we write that goes ahead and takes care of that for us. So I've got a clean platform I can build on. All right? So the next thing we do, how many of you ever work with SSIS, SQL Server Inter Information, or Integration Services? Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I had that look, too, on my face the first time I used it. Um, it is Microsoft's ETL play. Um, it gets the job done. This is the first half of the job that we run in batch mode. Remember, the first job was a parser that ran 24-7. This is the batch job. Um, you can't read it, and that's fine. Basically, the first row, they're running in sequence. The first row is downloading reference files from the FEC. Not reports, but like <coughs> many financial summary pages. The candidate, uh, the candidate summary pages bringing that down, putting it into the database so we can all go ahead and get to what we call, right in the middle there, called do the heavy lifting, which you'll see in a second here, which is where we do a lot of the work. The magic. Yes, well, you know what, yeah. So the remaining steps basically is we go ahead and we take the results of the heavy lifting, the brand new tables that it has produced, which are the, what we build products on top of, and it goes ahead and starts publishing them when necessary. We put reference tables up to SharePoint so clients can download them, that sort of thing. And then basically we end out at the end. This is, this is the heavy lifting. And you can tell this is different because clearly there is data coming together and being turned into brand new sources of data. Okay, I won't step through it bit by bit, but this, this is how we do that, that part of it. Okay, now hold on a second. It's all really simple to go ahead and line all this stuff up. Remember, it's tedious, but it's not hard. One of the problems is, in fact, the major problem is, is that remember on the other slide when we were talking about how these reports were produced, we had the person all the way on the side? The data is created by the people on the campaigns. They have no standardization for, many of the, for any of the vendor names. Our goal is to be able to tell who's working which, with, with which vendors, okay? You see the problem that's coming up in the next slide because there are an infinite number of ways to spell any given vendor, okay? I had to make a decision. Am I going to go ahead and attack this problem programmatically? I decided not to. So we went into the database, 410,000 unique vendor spellings, and standardize them. Now, we're lucky in that a lot of them I don't care about. I don't care if they're spending money at 7-Eleven. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And when you speak of vendors, could you define that again? A vendor is anybody, a vendor, <laughs> uh, campaigns or committees can give money to two types of, of entities. An individual or a vendor, which would be a company. If I buy television time, direct mail, placards or anything, that is going to what I call a vendor. Okay. So you have to go through and you have to scrub all of these up. <coughs> That's a decision you have to make. But you also have to make that decision because the goal is not to produce the database. The goal is to use it as a tool. 
and there's a certain lineage within our industry. And by that I mean, I know of one company that has had three different names as they merge and as they had a problem with the uh, with the uh, with the trademark problem with the trademark lawsuit, where the names are completely different, but they are all the same organization. So in order to really get a view and make this data useful, we have to go through the awful process of scrubbing them up to one name. That was one of the reasons we did this all by hand. Okay. Um, so. Okay, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. So we've gone ahead and we have <coughs> done the standardization. We've got it in relational form. And so it's good. I can go ahead and I can ask the database a specific question. Go ahead. So, so what do you mean you've done it by hand? Like, I mean, to, to get it all, all uniquely identified, you need to, some strategy to get Yes, I sorted it by the amount of money they had made. And I worked down that list for weeks. <laughs> that was my strategy. And I got rid of 7-Eleven and you know U-Haul and American Express and United Airlines and the banks and such. I only standardized the names which were of intelligence value to the project. But yeah, it was manual. There was no easy way to do that. And it was just you? It was more than yeah, it was, it was a team. It was <laughs> a <laughs> single threaded map reduce right. in his head. When I, when, I say, when I say we, I'm talking in the corporate sense, corporate sense of we, it's, it's me. All right, so we go ahead and we can ask the database a specific question. Give me a list of every vendor with amount and date for, for a specific campaign. Give me a list of every campaign for a specific vendor. This is good. This does not answer my question. Remember, the question we're trying to answer is, who knows who? And when I am working in SQL Server, I can only make one degree of separation. If I go for a second degree of separation, my query has just gotten dramatically more complicated. And what you'll find is, is that in order to write those queries, you almost have to know the answer before you bother writing the query. So clearly, after about 10 minutes of getting all this data in here, I realized I was kind of screwed. So I had to go ahead and look at a different database technology. Uh, how many people of you have ever played with Neo4j? Okay, that's what we picked. Uh, give me a second, and let me see if I can get this running. I'm going to need to. Sure, I, I can help you. I can co-pilot if you need help. Yeah. And then, actually, you know what? Can will this fiddle, will this uh, come over here? Uh, yeah, because there's a lot of clicking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks. Um, have any of you ever watched people eat ice cream and said, wow, I'd really like ice cream? Okay, because you're instructed on how to eat the ice cream. It's kind of like watching somebody do a demo. It's like, wow, it's great watching a demo. I'd like to play with it. This is the URL, username and password, if you guys want to get into the system. I will leave a version of this, I will leave this instance of the database available for you all to play with if you want to come by and get the username and password from me. If you want to see what it looks like, if you're thinking about doing a deployment within your organization. Okay. I just need to do this. And it's okay if they can't see the detail. It's more than it's more about the Okay. Let me show you something really quick here. So, I'm not seeing those files here. On the desktop? Yeah. Um, one, one, five, six, one, I see it on the This is the this is the that is the file of the it's not the file of the theory. Hold on a second here. Oh, you know what? Here it is. Okay. So, Neo4j is an open source project uh, that is used widely in government. It's very good at doing certain sort of tasks. Um, we adopted it because Microsoft gave up on their graph technology, so we didn't have much of a choice. Um, and so, the language used by Neo4j for going ahead and running these queries is called Cypher. Cypher is a lot like SQL. You can cut and paste and do pretty much a lot of what you need to do and not really understand the basics, but if you want to do more advanced stuff, 
you have to have almost a godlike understanding of the syntax. <laughs> so, but, so this is, this is the first query here. And you can't really read it, and that's fine, I guess. This is a, this is a company called Nation Consultants. This is a node, all right? Now, it's very difficult when I go out and talk to people about this who are used to working in Excel, because they're used to rows and columns, you know, Excel spreadsheets, SQL Server, Microsoft Access, rows and columns, rows and columns, rows and columns. The only way I can get to explain this is that I call these nouns. These are people, places, and things. And the people who are very advanced with Neo4j are probably horrified at my oversimplification, but this is the best way to get the point across. So, uh, so you see the nouns at the bottom, we have the adjectives, the things that describe the noun. For instance, I have the total amount of money that, they, that they've received, the state, the number of clients, the street address, that sort of thing. So I get an idea of where they are. All right, now here's the beauty. If I double click, there's their one client. Okay, that's another noun. And between them now is a verb, pays, with an arrow. So I can look at this and say that this guy's congressional campaign pays this group <coughs> that amount of money. <coughs> that's the adjective for the group, which I don't think is possible. But. So now how many of you are really curious of what's going to happen if I click on that green thing? Okay. <laughs> All the different vendors. All the different vendors. Okay. This is addictive. I have three monitors at home. I lost two hours just clicking stuff. I show this to other consultants and they're like, you know, look me up, look me up, look me up. Look me up. Look me up. And you go ahead and let's say, uh, I don't want to pick Google because that'll blow up the. Uh, <laughs> This is infinitely clickable. You have enough monitor space, you can click all day long. <laughs> right? um, so that that's how I would look up an organization. Now, what's really interesting is I go out and I do these demos. Because eventually I'll tell you what I did with this software. Is It's not just looking up an individual organization. Well, what do you know? There's the password for the system. Okay. Um, this is obviously a much more complicated uh, query. What I run? This is because I had to delete something. So you could think you have neo 4 j experts here on standby. Yeah. <laughs> Where were you guys when I started? Let me copy the query again, because this does work. Okay. This query is interesting, because what this is, is what clients the two vendors have in common. This is a very interesting question. I went into a demo once and I showed this and I said, give me the name of one of the partners who's sending you, one of the other consultants who's going ahead and is sending you business. All right. Okay, so we went ahead and we ran a query like this. And then I double clicked and I showed all of their clients that were not joint clients. There were like two or three of them. Then I double clicked the other guy who was supposed to be sending them clients. There were like 40 of them. Hmm. Demos stopped right there and they went and got on the phone because they realized that their client, that the guy was not helping them out like he was supposed to. <laughs> yeah. So have you implemented any sort of search on top of this? I'm sorry? Have you implemented any sort of search on top of Neo4j? No, because writing a, writing the ability to go, writing something, you're not the first person to ask, writing something that would allow me to go type in an English or a pull down into query, uh, into Cypher is beyond my means at this point. So what we do with people is basically we have a dozen of the most common types of uh, queries. We give them to them, and they just cut and paste. Because all they're really changing is the ID numbers and the names of the people that they're looking up. So what's the output format they, they find most easy? Visual. Visual. And then what happens is, is that they go ahead and they see this, and sometimes we give them the reference sheets of raw data, and then that allows them to go in and look at the raw data and, and do a little more searching and give them exactly what they want. Um, so that's that query. 
Now you can also go ahead and run this one, which is kind of the kind of the same query, but different. In that, if I know there's two companies out there. I can tell that one of them owns the other, guaranteed. Sharing that many clients, and if and if you look at the uh, if you look at the addresses for these two groups, same street address. One of them is a subsidiary of the other. Now, this is good and this is interesting and this is fun and you know you, you pop open a beer and you just look at this stuff for an hour or so, <laughs> but it doesn't solve the question that we were originally tasked with, which of who knows who because it only reflects financial relationships, okay? So I need you to just take this graph and just imagine that you have all of these relationships, you have all these committees and all of these vendors and all these payments, and they're all two-dimensional on the floor, okay? And you're standing above them, and you have a Rolodex of people. Now, as a consultant, my relationships with other consultants are not reflected in this database, because there's no money that's being reported. So I have to go ahead and hand clients the vendor sheet. And I say, listen, I want you to circle everybody who is a top contact for you. Every, everybody, at they, and everyone has their own definition, but basically it's anybody who, if you call them up, will, will give you information about one of their clients. Not secret stuff, but you know, who should I talk to? Are they about to get rid of their executive director? Are they out of money? That sort of thing. That's the, that is the, the additional note which we created which is not part of the FEC data, called starting point, okay? Now, you're going to see some data pop up here about the groups. It's completely fictional. Don't worry about it too much. So let's say that I am a group. Let's say that I'm, I'm somebody, I'm a stakeholder within, a, within, a, uh, within a, uh, a client of mine. I go ahead and I, I might have my company down on the floor showing the financial relationships. But I want to also see what my business cards will get me. So I go ahead. And notice the relationship has changed from pays to knows. Okay? And you notice because I know somebody at RPV in green, and I know somebody at Pound Feinstein, and Pound Feinstein is, the, is a vendor for, it also shows that other, the pays relationship. Now this is where it gets interesting. Because now I can go ahead and say, you know what? I have a particular committee a campaign, whatever, that I want to do business with. Which of my buddies can get me in the door? What this is telling me is that from starting point, starting point knows somebody at RPV, which goes ahead and ha is a client of MDI, which is already a vendor for the people I want to talk to. So instead of running around LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff, I have listed the two phone calls I have to make. Now, when I first saw this next query, or rather the results of the query, I said, oh my god, I can never let anybody see this, because it's just terrible. But I realized this is the most useful <coughs> query of all. It's the same type of query, just with different groups. And you can tell what's going to happen here, because it hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> you can hear it shook. Okay. This is what we call hitting an artery, where all of it, all the nodes pop up and it can barely display. This actually worked pretty well. Um, if I had 10 minutes and a bigger screen, I would draw them apart. What this shows me is that in my attempt to go from my starting point through my contact to some committee, I have no path. What that also tells me is, is that all of these groups that are in purple, these are vendors, I have no contacts to either. Those are the people I need to go have lunch with. Those are the people I need to invite out for, uh, for happy hour or throw an event. Because they have access to deal flow that I'm not seeing. Make sense? Questions? Do you do any work with non-political organizations? Um, such as the Masons, the Knights of Columbus, if you give school me a, systems? You can, you, the number of problems, that, the category of problems that you can solve with graph databases is growing rapidly. It's not just used for identifying terrorists anymore. Um, if you can come up with a data set and a use case, it's extremely easy to pour relational data into Neo4j. 
The problem is coming up with a use case for it. And that's something where you would have to sit down, you would have to sit down with somebody who knows what they're doing and talk them through it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. LinkedIn used to do you know, the third person Instagram with the second person. I'm sorry? LinkedIn was good about you could go if you were interested in contacting someone that was three steps away from you. It would tell you who was two steps away from you. And this and this solves the same category of problems. The problem is what data set are you putting into it? Yes. Yeah. So, so you, you showed that before your data pipeline. Uh, so do you do you keep your raw data organized in a relational database and yes. then you pull it into the right. Graph? When you saw the when you saw the big chart of the SSIS packages, that's all still working in relational data. There is another piece of code that goes ahead and pulls all the relational data out and places it into Neo4j. Oh, okay. All right. We the live database does not live in Neo4j. This is simply a productization of what's in the underlying relational database. So, so this Neo4j then like uh, establishes a communication channel between the database, or you have to no. I will I will code to go ahead and push data into Neo4j. Oh, okay. Neo Neo4j has no. It has it has no native capability to talk to the relational database on its own. <coughs> There's no import function with yeah. that way. Okay. So was another one in the back. Are you uh, incorporating IRS data into this, like the 990s? <laughs> That's a secret, I assume. No, no, no. It's not a secret. Um, yes, but I have not finished scrubbing that data up yet. But yeah, I see where you're going with that, and it's not a bad idea. Where did you obtain that from? Uh, you can download it off. You can when he says the 990 data. Everybody who is an, uh, an exempt organization, a C3, C4, any of those groups, uh, has to file financial records with the IRS, uh, basically summary data. Is it, it is not a bad idea to take that data, throw it into the O4J, and see if you can see relationships within the nonprofit groups. Because for many people, selling to a political group is the exact same thing as selling to a nonprofit group. They all have a mission, they all have membership, they all need money, and they all got a report. So from our view, they're largely the same. Sorry, there's another one back there? Yeah. Yeah, when you were first talking about the FCC data, it sounded like your brain was the vendor. But once you started talking about the starting point, it sounded like here's where you're getting into the people, the employees, the partners, the principals. Can you explain that yeah, a little bit more about the granularity? Okay. Let's say that we're a corporation. Or let's say that you guys are a vendor, you know, XYZ, Acme Incorporated, okay? Um, when I go ahead and he is a client, and he wants to say that I have a, I have a relationship with Acme Incorporated. He obviously does it with the corporation. He has it with some people within the corporation. So what he does to, to go ahead and get that into this, what he does is basically circle the organization. It is his job when somebody says, hey, can you call somebody over at Acme, to know who he's supposed to call over there. Because we can't track, we, we could, but it would, not be, it would not be feasible for us to track all of the employees within a vendor. We'd have no way of getting that data let alone maintain. So, so the relation, the those relationships are a vendor to vendor thing or a vendor to committee thing. Who you call within the organization, that's something you gotta know how to do yourself, who your person over there is. Does that make did that cover? I think so. And so if uh, someone branches off from a company, they form their own firm, right. that that history, that lineage that you know Greenberg and Lake used to be an entity together, that's that's kind of lost in this. It's just a different company at that point. Well, remember I talked about lineage when we were scrubbing up those records earlier. Is you have to kind of determine what happened. Did was it what, when they when the group split? Did most of the people that you are concerned about move to another group with a new name? Did they keep the name? Did the group just pretty much dissolve completely? That's a judgment call when you're scrubbing those records to identify the lineage of the vendor. Does that make sense? Sorry. Um, as a segue to that point. I see you have one individual pop up there. Um, why is it only one, and who is that individual? Uh, okay. Um, individuals on campaigns, um, they're nomadic. Let's put it that way. You're, you're out of a job every year, the day after the election, win or lose. The problem that we have is that if you are a campaign worker in Virginia, and another campaign worker of your same name shows up in Ohio, I have no way of knowing if that's the same person. And so there's no way for me at this point to rationalize that to a single individual. 
that would be really cool though. Now there are some, like the top names that I am doing, which is more for vanity projects to go ahead and see which top staffers are working with which groups. But as far as like the people who are not making 100 grand, there's no way to clean that data up. Because the FEC, no one assigns them a unique identifier. And you know, you may, you may be the same person, but on one campaign, you've probably got four addresses. You've got your current address, you got your parents' address, which is what you filled out on your W-4s when you signed up. You got the PO box where they sent the check to once. Uh, it, it gets very confusing for these people to keep track of where they are. Any other questions? Yeah. Does the uh, EIN for nonprofits, does that have a sort of structure for managing the lineages? The nonprofit groups? Yeah. Yeah, they, would, they have a unique identifier, which would be the EIN, the employer identification number. Uh, we actually had to apply our own unique identifier to vendors. Uh, so, you know, certain companies, a, a company theoretically will have that same identifier no matter what. My goal is eventually is everybody runs around the city who's in politics and has their identifier on their business cards. Because that's what I'll know. <laughs> okay. um, so um, this is this is good for so me is, going ahead and like I said, going from a my starting point to a specific client. But let's say I don't have any specific in mind. Is I want is I want to go ahead then and I want to run this. With this query, you can kind of look at the text of the query. What I'm saying here is, is that I want to know everybody who's two hops away from me who's got at least 150,000 or 1.5 million cash on hand. I want to know who those campaigns are. And you can do some interesting stuff with this. You can go ahead and take, you can go ahead and adjust the amount of money. You can filter by the type of campaign, the partisan nature of the campaign. You can go ahead and increase the number of hops to, to three, to four, to five, to however much screen space you have. And you can go ahead and say, well, this is the list of people I need to start working. So the system can be used not just for targeting campaigns that you already know about. It can be looking for campaigns that you don't even know about, but you should know. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. How big is the database and uh, where is it hosted? Uh, well, uh, I wish I could say it wasn't sitting underneath my desk at home right now. Um, no, the, uh, the database is, the, the relational database is about 110 million contributions and about 40 million disbursements, because we go back a ways. The relational database is surprisingly small. I'm sorry, the, the, the graph database is surprisingly small. How many this, nodes in there? I'm sorry? How many nodes in there? I will learn how to write the query to tell me that, but I would say I, it would be a Cartesian product if I'm using that term correctly with all the nodes and links. It would be in the hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions. If I were to go ahead and pull up Act Blue here, which is the Democratic fundraising group that everybody's on the Democratic side's money runs through, I'd crash the laptop. Because it's uh, not crash it, but I would, I would blow this browser away because it's, ju it's just pure clients. Um, now, sorry, did you have a question? Um, not, not like <coughs> what, what, what kind of a graph algorithm is this? So so gra what graph is what? What kind of graph algorithm is the, the thing that it's using? The, oh, you mean with the, I have no idea. The, the, the Neo4j is kind of like SQL Server or Excel. It's just something that I'm pouring data into. I don't know, and aside from the query language, I don't know that much about its inner guts. And frankly, web design scares me, so I don't know a lot about how this visualization and Java stuff works. Uh, but, it, but Neo4j is an open source project if you want to go rip it apart and take a look. Um, so at the end of the day, I, sh I built this for internal purposes to sell stuff to people. And I showed it to a friend of mine who's in roughly the same business. And the only question he asked me was, how much? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, how much is it going to cost me? I'm like, so it's pricing, think fast, because somebody wants to write you, a, write you a check. It never dawned on me until that moment that in trying to build a product, in trying to build a tool internally to sell products, I'd actually built another product. Because it's gone, gone ahead and, and spawned a number of other products. For instance, we have a notification service. Every time a new political campaign committee is formed, you get an instant alert, because we're downloading those files constantly in real time. 
We have licensed data out to Caltech. They're using it for a study about contributions and political outcomes. There is another, uh, there are real uses within reporting to go ahead and track large flows of money between political committees. Uh, it's pretty much endless. And the way that people use this, this product shocks me every time I see it. Because they're coming up with ideas I've never, th I, I never thought of before. So, so you started trying to answer a specific question, and now you find yourself with something that you, you think you could, I guess, commercialize, right? No, it is commercialized. There are, there are active licenses for the software. No, no, no. I'm, basically, your data set right. is the magic sauce for, for this software, right? Yeah. So are you going to go back and start over from scratch with what you've learned, or are you going to just add to the data? No, I am not. It is a, it is a brownfield application. I did. I will do little fixes here and there, but I don't plan on radically rewriting the software because it runs and it runs reliably. Okay. But you're right in that it's n it hasn't been step A B C D E. It's been I get down to this step and I'm like, oh wait a sec, and you wrap back. It's been a, it's been a real learning experience. It's a lot of technologies I'd never used before. Okay. Another question in back. Are you using some of the uh, property fields on? Uniforms there to grid out a destroyer associated with people and uh, nodes like at any level? Um, it, I, in the reference sheet which we supply to clients, which lists all of the vendors in an Excel spreadsheet, we do have the fields for, uh, we do have extended data onto that, like uh, LinkedIn, Google search, that sort of thing. So we do extend that data. The problem is, is that these, uh, these nodes have no functionality beyond double clicking to see what's attached to it. But it would be pretty cool if you could right click and say bring up these guys' LinkedIn profile. Anything else? Is this just applicable to basic fundraising as well? <laughs> uh, let's see, the guy in the back is nodding his head. Yes, in theory you could use this for fundraising, but using FEC data for fundraising? Well, not, well, not FEC, but I meant like just Oh yeah, process. if you, you yeah, if you could go ahead and find the, the nodes, the yeah, if you could go ahead thing. and you could find an underlying data set. Yeah. Yeah, you could absolutely use this for fundraising. You could pour Twitter I would be fascinated to find somebody who wanted to do a project where we pour Twitter data into here. Or you yeah. go ahead and you get uh, alumni lists, I mean, whatever yeah. whatever you get in fundraising, it might be possible to put into this. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lo lots of possibilities with graph and I want to talk to you about potentially uh, overlaying this with social media, social network data, because I worked on a, not with Neo4j, but with another graph technology, right. overlaying, you know, the LinkedIn and the Twitter uh, and Facebook right. graph, and putting three people in a company to say, let's all three import our graphs right. and see what connectivity we have. Well, there was there was somebody who did a project who was not supposed to talk about it. He was doing it. He was at a tech talk and it was a big uh, government relations firm in town. What they did was they went out and they had told everybody who worked for them, I want to list every contact you have and every issue that those people know about. And they built something like this, so that yeah. any issue anywhere in the country in real time, they know who to call. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a scary technology. Mm. <laughs> I mean, not scary bad, but mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's like as people went from like old databases to relational databases and all kinds of things became possible. It's a whole new set of questions you can solve with this that you couldn't even approach with relational databases. What about all the relationships that aren't legit, <laughs> you know, or that are kind of underground or hidden? Or if they're not in the data, I can't represent them. Yeah. Now, I could go ahead and build, just like we had starting point, maybe I could go ahead and build another type of relationship, which is, you know, on the board of or something like that and look for interlocking board memberships. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, thanks. So, what are you actually selling? Because you're not making that hat and selling that independently. You're, no, you're well, selling you and the product to subject no. to expert users. What, what, we, what we are selling basically is this with, with data updated every week. Is one of the things that we're selling off of this. The ability, let's say that let's say that you are a television, let's say that you do television commercials. Yeah. Is that you go ahead and you use this technology to go ahead and figure out who you need to talk to in order to sell your stuff to campaigns. But I don't need, need you, I need to know the, the coding language. Well, you, you need to be able to cut and paste 
So that's it. Cut and paste. Yeah, that's basically it's cut and paste. I had, I had, I, I could not come up with a better solution than cut and paste. And, and to be honest with you, it works too. But you don't have to be in the room. I, I don't have to be in the room. So no, no, no. I don't do that in the room thing anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sitting at home with the dog. Okay, and then I just cut <laughs> right. and I have to cut on my own. Okay. Right. It, it, it's, it, it gives you the ability to freely explore the graph. Now, and then we supply, like I said, the, wor the, the, the worksheets that have the identifying numbers so you know what to cut and paste into the query. But yeah, that's basically how it works. When you want to come to it with the subject matter expertise, like at this point? No, because then I, you mean a subject matter expert of, for Neil for J or of their industry? Of their industry. No, because in order to supply a subject matter expert for their industry, I would have to go ahead and uh, go ahead and find someone who knew, knew more about their business than they did. And it's, it's easier yeah, for me to give exactly. them the tool. And, the, and it's amazing to watch the learning curve as they see yeah. the relationships represented here that they have seen represented at happy hour at industry events, at conventions and such, about things that they've heard about when they see it proved out in the financial data. Guys, so we can continue the conversation after the meetup. Uh, we're running a, a bit behind, but um, yeah, and I, I could talk to Timothy about graph databases and specifically, you know, mapping relationships and using that for business development. I think that's awesome. Um, thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. So um, if you're looking to connect with folks who had announcements, meet uh, over there by the yellow logo. Uh, let's be respectful and mindful that um, this is a at some point, um, so let's by 9 p.m. And um, you know, it's time. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, and uh, I don't know what bars are around here. But if, if, if a group of us wants to go out for after the meetup, uh, we can we can go somewhere. I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate maybe, it. Maybe if you go to the Chinese restaurant, you can get your parking validated. Well, where's the Chinese restaurant? Um, it's in here in the building. It's in the building? Yeah. Oh, OK.